perspective? Well, it's everything. It directs us, it brings focus to our lives. We all want to experience what's best for us. So maybe the first step towards experiencing God's best in my life is to ask the question, what is my perspective? Where we are, it seems like life just speeds up in a crazy way. And many times that impacts us as people, it impacts us as our perspective, as we see the world around us and how we operate. And if we're being honest, none of us really want to be, you know, miserable, grumpy, or stingy, do we? We don't, we don't necessarily want to be that way. But a large majority of people, I mean, I believe a large majority of people want to be generous with their lives. We just, how we see things makes it difficult. It's hard. Somehow, some way, though, there's some people that, well, that have figured it out, that have found out, found a way to express and to, and to live in a way that, well, just shows generosity pouring out of them. And we know it when we see it. When we hear that word generosity, we think of financially, we think of the generosity that comes with giving of money, but the generosity we're talking about is of our entire lives. Be generous with our time and our and our talents and our, our money and our, and our encouragement that flows out of our mouths. Many times when we see people this way that are just living, they're just different than the world around them, we often ask the question, how do they do that? What, what is it? How do they, why, why are they the way that they are? How, how, do, how can I maybe experience that? Well, we believe what the, the answer is found in the perspective that they have in their lives. The overflow perspective. It's in how they perceive the world. It's how they perceive their circumstances. It's how they perceive their relationships. It's how they perceive their possessions. And I think each and every one of us, we all have, we have perspective in life. I believe that there's, there's, in my estimation, there's three different perspectives that we can have in life. There's probably more, but this is how I see things, so just bear with me as I go through this. But I believe there's three, there's three different states and postures that we live in our life and how we see things. The first one, I believe, is, is overwhelmed. We have an overwhelmed perspective of the world around us, of the circumstances around us, the relationships around us. We have an overwhelmed perspective about possessions in our lives. And what this is, this perspective that we have, is, is really what it is, is, is an outside-in sequence that takes place in our life. It's the outside world impacting my internal clock and how I operate within. When you look at the definition of overwhelmed, it's, it's the definition is to bury or drown underneath something. It's to just overwhelm, to come over, to weigh down and push down. And there's this perspective that we have is many times we don't maybe don't realize it until well, the, the chaos of the world begins to show up. Our pursuit after, after what the world is offering our continuous pursuit, we begin to see, find ourselves weighed down by the stresses of this. We have these goals that we want to reach in our lives, that if I can get to this place, it's all going to be good. If I can just get there, that, that, that my perfect situation, my per the perfect conditions will bring a perfect peace within me. So we strive and we strive and we strive and we strive, and when we don't obtain it, we find ourselves overwhelmed, weighed down. Filled with stress and fear and worry. So that's one, that's one perspective I believe that we have in this world. That another perspective I have is an overflowing perspective. We have an opportunity to have an overflowing perspective. This is, when you, it, when you think about overflowing, this is an inside-out sequence that takes place. And how we see things. What's happening on the inside will impact the outside. It's the, when you look at the definition of overflowing, it's an excess. It's a, a flowing over the edges ordeal. When, when, when I believe, when we have this type of perspective, I believe that there's a, a security in we are, who we are. That we don't need to strive to compare or to match up to others. That what the world is asking us to live up to, but that we would be secure in who we are and what we have to offer to this world. That we just look at things completely differently. <laughs> Now, there's, there's two perspectives, 
is the overwhelmed and the overflowing. And I think the other perspective that we have in this world is we're just unaware. We don't even know how we see things. We just take things at face value. I thought seriously about just calling this the ignorant perspective. But I know how that, that, that feels a little ouchy. I get it. There's nothing wrong with that word, but that's the truth. is that we just don't know. We don't know what we don't know. We see the world for what it has to offer. We pursue after these things. And then ultimately what ends up typically happening is it ends up leading us into this place of an overwhelmed perspective. But, but honestly, this is the most comfortable state to be in. It's just to be completely unaware. But it was the, it, ignorance is bliss, right? Like I just don't know any better. So it makes it, makes it comfortable to be, in, to be in it until it's uncomfortable. And then we have to start going, well, what's going on? But this is, this is simply just existing in life and moving forward. Now, I believe that there, in each and every one of us, there's something in each and every one of us, regardless of the, the state we're in, regardless of the perspective that we have, regardless of how we see the world, how overwhelmed, overflowing, or unaware we are, there is something within us that, that, that causes us, desires to be like the people that we see that are just different than the others around them. The people that have this, this perspective, the way that they're living their life, that just just this energy that we want, we want, we desire to be like that. And so we believe that we can't be like that, and then we, we dislike those people, then don't we? We get annoyed by those people. But I believe that there's truly, there's something in us that desires this. And the only way to, be, to begin to explain is to say that, that these individuals, what, what they're experiencing is that they just know something that the rest of the world doesn't know. They know something that everyone else needs to know. And the great thing about what they know, in my belief, the great thing that they, they know is that they have a knowledge that is accessible to each and every one of us. That's something that we can know. Do you want to know what they know? No? Okay, I'll see you guys later. <laughs> Do you guys want to know what they know? Yeah. You probably already know. You want, here's, what, here's what they know. They know who they are. They know who they are. More importantly, they know who they belong to. That's, that's the difference. I want you to, there's a couple of verses in a psalm that David wrote that I think really des describes this position, this posture, this state of being, this perspective, that really it, he, he encompasses it in a couple verses in Psalm chapter 16. It starts in verse 5. It says this, Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. I want to stop there for just a moment because that word cup is a huge deal. We see, this, we, we see it being used in, as a symbol all throughout Scripture, all throughout Scripture, we see that word cup. And, many, and what we see, that it, what this cup describes is our life. It describes our fate. It describes our being. It describes, it describes our purpose and our plan for our life, this cup, that's, that, that's mentioned by David here. And what, he's, what David is stating is that God, the Lord, is, is my portion. He's my life. He's my, he's my folk. He is. He's my security. He is my portion. Then it goes on in the verse six, verse 6, and it says this, The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. But I love that. I love that line right there, that verse right there. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Meaning that the, that the boundaries that were there, the things that have been, maybe I've been hindered in my life. Lord, you have become my life. You have become my portion. You become, you are who I am. And because of this, there is no, there's no boundary in the pleasant places of my life. It's overflowing. It's, it's, it's just pouring out. And then he goes on when he says, surely I have a delightful inheritance. That's one word I want us to hold on to because we're going to come, we're going to come back to that. There's that, that David's use of the word inheritance. He says, with life giving over to the Lord, life entrusted, the perspective to see that the boundaries in his, in his life have fallen in these good places. 
This is a very significant perspective. Because many times, if we're living in this unaware, this overwhelmed perspective in our life, we are bounded up by what the world has to offer around us. That this is all that I have. This is the things that I need to strive for. Because in this place, I will find, I will find joy in this. He continues on in verse 7. It says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at, my, at night, my heart, inst my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. And with him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. And we read this, and, and you read these, these few verses, and, and it's pretty easy to look at that and go, well, things must be, this is good circumstances. It's easy to say that this is what's going to take place, because this is good. I'm sure, I'm sure he's experiencing great things in this time. This, this is coming from the pleasant places, uh, uh, pleasant circumstances. And, and maybe that's the truth in this particular psalm. Is from this that place, but I want to I want to take a moment because that's not where David always was. His circumstances weren't always wonderful. I mean, he was the king, but he also experienced some very difficult experiences. His circumstances all weren't always wonderful. weren't always pleasant. So when we begin to look at this, we go we go just a few more psalms later. In the twenty third psalm, you see that this is written from a very a very dark place. The 23rd Psalm is one that's very familiar. We hear it spoken at, at many times at funerals. There's this place, that you, but you hear from David's heart. He's, it's written from a dark place. It's a valley of the shadow of death that he is, he is writing this from. He's expressing the Lord is with him in the midst of this. That his that focus is on, on, on him, the sh good shepherd. And we get to the fifth verse of this 23rd Psalm, and, and he goes on, he says this. He says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup overflows. When we go back to that, we go back to the symbolism of what the cup, my life, my, my future, the plans that are for me, the, the, my being. He's saying, like, in this... My, my, my life is overflowing in the valley of the shadow of death. In the presence of my enemies, my cup is overflowing. My life is overflowing. He's saying that there, you are, are anointing at my head, which means this anointing of, of my head is, is, a, is a setting apart from the ordinary. That this doesn't necessarily make sense to the world around me, but in the midst of all of this, my, cup, my life is overflowing because you, Lord, are the one that is guiding me through this. What a huge perspective check that we could take from this, this psalm in itself. When you begin to pro when you begin to look at what's taking place, what he is, what he's showing us. He's showing us that there's we're in this dark place in the valley of the shadow of death, surrounded by my enemies. And we can be focused on that, or as he was. He was focused on the blessed, glorious, bountiful table that was set before him in the presence of his enemies. That he wasn't focused on necessarily the circumstances that were around him, but he was focused on the blessings that God was providing for him right smack dab in the middle of this. The perspective, this perspective is a matter of, of confidence. This is, this is a very confident statement that David is providing, that he is sharing, that he is, he is praying out, that he's singing. But this, this matter of confidence is, is not necessarily on, on who he thinks he is, but it's more focused on, on, on who he belongs to. This perspective that could ultimately could change and shift our worlds, the way that we see things. Now I want to return back to that 16th Psalm and, and, and David's use of the word inheritance because it's a big deal. We see, we see that there's, a, there's a, a letter that was written to the Hebrews, Hebrew followers of Jesus in, in, in the 12th chapter. The writer encouraged them to, that in the face of opposition, it's important to keep their focus, their eyes focused on Jesus and how he has led them through this. To take his example and to emulate it, to make it a part of their lives, that this is how they would operate. That they would pursue that life. 
Then they would pursue the, 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 the way that Jesus would lead them. They would pursue after that, even in the face of opposition. Letting them know that there's going to be, there's going to be shaking that takes a place. And because, me, because of that shaking, there will be many, there will be many that will fall away from, from following Jesus. Because it was just too much. But he, but he stopped, he wraps up this chapter, this 12th chapter with this bit of encouragement. He says this in Hebrews 12, verse 28, he says, Therefore, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful. And so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. What, he, what, he's, stating to the, what he's stating to these these followers of Jesus is, listen, I need you to understand something, is that this is going to get difficult. There's going to be a time where it is going to, the tree is going to be shaken. Are you going to hold on? Many are going to let go. You know, it's interesting, when I look outside today, when I pulled up into my driveway late last night, and then I got up this morning, and I looked up in the trees, and I'm like, I can't believe there's still leaves in these trees. They just, they're so stubborn. They just want to hold on. <laughs> Can we just be done with this, right? But that's what, that's what, that's what the, the writer of Hebrews, what God has designed for us, is that we would hold on to the truth. We would hold on to the foundation that he has provided for us. That regardless of what takes place, because there's going to be a shaking, that if we would hold on with what we all that we have, we keep our eyes focused on Jesus, that we would give our lives over to him, when our lives are devoted to him, we are inheriting something that is steady, that it won't be shaken under the world's circumstances, that when everything else crumbles under the weight of sin and brokenness, will not go anywhere. That the kingdom of God, from the very beginning to the very end, will always be there. And that we are afforded the opportunity. We are given an inheritance. We are heirs to this kingdom when we choose to keep our eyes focused on Jesus, when we make him the Lord of our lives. So this kingdom of God, what good question would be, what is this kingdom of God? To define what this is, is to describe it would be that it's, it's eternal. The kingdom of God is eternal, that there's no end to it. From the very beginning, in a formless void, through eternity it was, and it is, and it will be present. Regardless of what's going on, this will be present. It will be available to, to be steady, to be founded, to not go anywhere, regardless of what's going on. You know, when I think of kingdoms, I think of, I, I go back to like medieval times, and I think of, I think of kings with crowns, and I think of, you know, I think of, uh, I think of treasures, I think of, uh, I think of gold, I think of corruption. <laughs> That's what I think of, right? That's what the world has shown us in this. But what Jesus is talking about, what, what, what he has offered for us, what God has provided for us, what the author of Hebrews is reminding his brothers and sisters is that what, what, what is being offered will not go away. See, kingdoms fall, come and fall on this world. Treasure come and goes. But the Lord is always, will be, was, will, is, and will be. And Jesus, in his words, he, he shared this about our treasures. He says, do not store up your treasures, yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. What he's, what he's saying is everything, everything that we have here is going to go away. Everything that he's offering for us will be there forever. If we, would, if we would keep our eyes focused on him. So the kingdom of God is eternal. What else is the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God is, in, in, is inside out. The kingdoms of this world are all outside in. The riches and the, and the power and, and all that they have, the possessions that they have, that brings, that brings kingdoms about in this, on this earth. The kingdom of God is something that comes from the outside in. 
Romans 14, 17 says this, For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. The kingdom of God is, is, something, that is, is something that resides within us. It's something that brings life to us, something that brings peace and joy and righteousness to us. It's not outside in. It's not overwhelming. It's not so found solely in following rules and decrees. It is found in and through an inside-out change. It's found in keeping our eyes and keeping our hearts devoted to God, to Jesus. We see this in people who are living with an overflow perspective. We see people with joy and peace and righteousness, regardless of what's going on around them. Why? How is this possible? Because it's, a, it's an inside-out sequence. Because it comes from the inside out. The outside doesn't bother the inside. It's not overwhelming in that way. But it's overflowing. It, pours, it should pour out of us. And the crazy thing about this is many times we, we look at ourselves and we struggle with this because we don't see that change happening in us, right? Well, I don't have joy. I don't have peace. I definitely don't think I'm righteous. But I want you to understand, because it is an out, inside-out sequence, it takes time. But that also makes it more permanent, more steady. It may not be visible. See, this kingdom that we're offered to inherit is unshakable, it's eternal, and rules and reigns. And it is inside out. This is security. We spend most of our lives trying to secure our kingdom and our future as the world offers it. And many times, it leads us to this overwhelmed perspective. It leads us to a place where we just keep striving and, and doing more and trying to get more possessions and earn more and get ourselves to a place where we feel like, if I just get here, I'm good. Like, we, we push and push and push and push. But what the kingdom of God offers is something that is so secure that, that along with Apostle Paul, I, that I, would, I would say I'm right there with him, that I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us. Will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. This is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is, is our, our desire, our relationship with him. And the change that takes place within us leaves us in a more stable ground that even regardless of how hard the world is shaking, we have stable ground because of he who is in us. So how do we grab a hold of this? How do we grab a hold of this overflow perspective? How do we get this, how do we get this into our lives? I believe we must remind ourselves that who we belong to and what that means for us. So the first step in, in grabbing a hold of this overflow perspective, well, number one is where are your eyes anyways? Who, who, who are you following? What kingdom are you trying to, to live in and serve? And when you've got our eyes focused on Jesus, the, the step would be is to be reminded. We would be reminded that we would, it's really easy to forget that God calls us his and what he offers us in response to of receiving Jesus as our Savior and Lord of our life. We, it's really easy for us to forget that. We have to take actionable steps in our own lives to be reminded that this is the truth. That this is what's being offered to us. This is, this is the, the benefit of knowing Jesus in our life would be that we would, be inherit, we would inherit this unshakable kingdom. That we would be reminded as, as Peter is trying to remind the, the church in 1 Peter 2.9, he says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession that you may declare praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. This, this is the things that we need to be reminded of. How do we do that? We need to find scripture that will remind us. We need to find scripture like 1 Peter 2, 2 9. And we would, we would, maybe we would put it on post notes all around us. We would put it on our lock screens for our phones. We would, we would put music on and listen to that has 
has the script, has scripture that's reminding us of who we are and who we belong to. That would fill our, our environment with reminders of God's goodness. That we would, we would do that. We would surround ourselves with those reminders. That regardless of what's going on in the world, we would see these truths and we would hold on to them. Not only would we be reminded by, by putting it all around us in our environment, but we would speak these truths to ourselves. That we would, we would speak these things and believe, look at, look at ourselves in the mirror and say, this is true. This is the truth. Even when we're feeling otherwise, right? Even when we don't feel this way. Even when we feel like we're falling short, that we don't have anything to offer. When we feel like we have, have no worth to the kingdom of God. Even when we have these things that we would look in the mirror and we would remind ourselves. That we are, that, that as Paul reminded the, the Ephesians... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with saints and members of the household of God. That we would be reminded, we would be reminded that we belong to him. Not only would we would remind ourselves, but we would, we would find others to remind us as well. That we would make sure that we would find the other saints and other, the other members of the household of God. And we would involve them in our lives so that they could help remind us of who we truly are. We need to find others that, that you can speak about, about Jesus with, that you can have conversations about Jesus with, to share the hope that you have with others. This, this is what it's about. We would find others that can, can affirm who we are in Jesus. And the second part of this is that, is that we would remind others as well. That we would remind others who they are as well. Sometimes the best way to remind ourselves is to be sharing that truth with somebody else. I don't know how many times I've sat in front of somebody who just needed me just to share some encouragement about who they are. And in that, I'm reminded about who I am. And I'm encouraged. I'm encouraged by the truth that is being shared to somebody else. You want to feel, you want to be, be inspired by who, who God created you to be? Share who somebody is in Christ to them. And that will inspire you. That's how we remind ourselves, by reminding others as well. Paul wrote to the Philippians and says, Hey, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility. Value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So we would remind ourselves, we would remind others of who we are, who we belong to, and here's the next step to it, and we would believe it. We would choose to believe that truth. That we would believe it for others and believe it for you. The problem is, is that so often in this world, we get so lost in our cynicism and our skepticism that we miss. We miss the goodness that's taking place. Sometimes, sometimes, sometimes where we're at, because you might not even believe that, sometimes you have to believe the unbelievable. Sometimes you, you have to go, <laughs> I don't see it. I don't, I don't see it, but I'm going to choose, choose to believe it today. I'm going to choose to walk into that. That's not, that's not cocky. That's not arrogant. That's, that's being confident in who God is. How, how he is, the truth that he is sharing about who you are. That that doesn't change. That that's not, that's not full of baloney. That, that is real. That, that's having confidence in who he is. So that we can eventually, we can, stand and we can stand in front of a mirror, we can stand in front of somebody else and tell them these things, but we would believe these things, the things that seem so unbelievable, that we would believe that I don't have to be overwhelmed. I don't have to be overwhelmed because he has already given me all that I will ever need. That I don't have to, that, that, that I would believe that because of his abundant goodness, I can live an overflowing life. That I can believe that I am loved and accepted. That I can believe that I am, I am redeemed and forgiven. That I am free and complete in Jesus Christ. That I am chosen and holy. That I am not alone for he is with me. That I can believe that there is nothing to fear because Jesus is life. That he gave. That if I would choose to believe, believe that, that I will be an heir to an unshakable kingdom. That I can believe that I can be grateful regardless of my external circumstances. Because my future is secure in the hands of the creator of all things. Amen. These are things that we need to believe. These are the things that are, these are, this is the, 
the unshakable kingdom that is being offered to us if we would choose to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. An overflowing life becomes out of this place of knowing who we are and who we belong to. <coughs> that we can stand in front of a mirror and say this simple statement, I am his. When we believe that, things begin to change within us. But the world offer isn't enough. But what Jesus offers, 